Good evening. I'm Paul Glassman, Director of Scholarly and Cultural Resources, and I'd like to welcome you to Yeshiva University Library's Spring Book Talk. Uh, we're fortunate to present two Yeshiva College English Department faculty members, Rachel Mesh and Liesl Schwab, in conversation about Professor Mesh's recently published book, Before Trans, Three Gender Stories from 19th Century France. Rachel Mesh is professor of French and English and chair of the, of the Yeshiva College English Department. She has taught at Yeshiva College for 13 years and is looking forward to teaching her first class at Stern College for Women in the fall. She is the author of three books relating to gender in 19th century France, The Hysterics Revenge, French Women Writers at the Fin de Siècle, published by Vanderbilt University Press in 2006, Having It All in the Belle Epoque, How French Women's Magazines Invented the Modern Woman, published by Stanford University Press in 2013, and Before Trans, the subject of our discussion this evening. Published in May of 2020, Before Trans was one of six books shortlisted for the American Library in Paris Annual Book Award, and it was named to the 2021 Rainbow Book List by the American Library Association. Liesl Schraub served as a 2018-19 Fulbright Nehru Scholar in Kolkata, India. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Words Without Borders, and Lit Hub, among other publications. She has directed the writing program at Yeshiva College since 2015, but began her work at YU in 2004 as a faculty tutor in the Writing Center. On a more personal note, I'd like to mention how inspiring both Rachel Mesh and Liesl Schwab are to me. Professor Mesh is continually in search of creative components for her literature courses, for example, in Parisian Views, the students create a Pollock Library exhibition of their own photographic views of New York City. And as writing program director, Professor Schwab generously shares her treasure trove of engaging exercises for making writing intensive courses lively and impactful. We'll begin with an introduction by Professor Mesh and then Professors Mesh and Schwab will discuss the book. Uh, if you have questions, please put them into the chat and address them to everyone. And then we will allow plenty of time uh, for those questions to be read to our presenters. So with that, I turn things over to Professor Mesh. Thank you so much. Um, I am so delighted to be here. Um, with you tonight and to see so many lovely faces and names. Um, don't be, don't feel pressured to put those cameras on. I know how it is. I'm impressed with every single one of you who is here on Zoom uh, at 7.30 at night um, in this craziness of a year. So thank you, thank you. And I'm delighted to be in conversation with you and my dear colleague, Liesl Schwab. Um, so thank you, Paul, for that really lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I have some images. Um, so here we go. Okay. Um, shameless book promotion. If you decide to purchase the book, <laughs> you should do it at a discount from the publisher. All right. So I want to... Um, take you back to 19th century France for starters. Um, some of you have been there with me before um, and you know that's where I like to dwell. Um, and it's a time when gender roles were rapidly changing in France. Um, and the shifts that resulted from those changes have been the focus of really nearly all my work basically since graduate school. And that was initially through a focus on French women writers. So I just wanted to give you like a tiny bit of background. We can talk about this more later, but how I came to this book from my previous research. So um, in my previous book, Having It All in the Belle Epoque, I was looking at how French women's magazines in the early 1900s 
tried to combat the woman writer's terrible reputation as it, as it had evolved over the course of the 19th century. These are just some little fun examples. Um, the woman writer was depicted as a man-hating, husband-defying, cigarette-smoking threat to the French family, just responsible for basically the downfall of French civilization. Um, and that is not as an exaggeration. So in that book, um, looking at these French women's magazines, I was showing how these magazines, in particular this one, Femina, was working against that image of femininity by consciously constructing images of the woman writer as this hyper-feminine, ideal woman who could balance femininity and feminism. That was the having it all. And it was in the context of my study of these women's magazines, um, which probably, you know, some of you heard me speak about years ago, um, and seeing image after image of women writers depicted in this way, doing fabulous things, flaunting their femininity and their fabulousness all at once, that I came across Jane Dulafoy. Um, who really sort of launched this project before trans for me. So Jane de la Foy in men's clothing, um, looking not hyper-feminine, but extremely masculine, often alongside Jane's husband, Marcel. There they are in, um, in their, 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 their office. Um, now, despite this distinct appearance, which was really out of the norm for this magazine where everyone was, as I said, in these flowing dresses and pearls, um, de la Foy was very much um, so, so it was always understood rather as um, an expression of feminism, despite the fact that this appearance was so out of sync with, with that of de la Foy's peers. But I had a sense that there was something different and important going on here, something that didn't really align with everything that I had learned about French feminist history. And so when I finished working on that book, I really, I just started trying to figure out what was going on with Jane de la Foy. I was fascinated by this, by this, by this figure. Junafoy was part of the all-woman jury that created one of the most important literary prizes that still exists in France. And they were very much involved in promoting women and getting women to participate in society and be professional and write in all kinds of things, pushing them out of these traditional roles. But at the same time, Junafoy didn't really identify with other women. Um, and the, the pants wearing part wasn't really a new discovery. Scholars of this time were particularly scholars of women writers, knew about de la Foy, knew about you know, this persona, but they always considered de la Foy through the lens of feminism. And that's really been the only way um, that scholars have understood people from this time period who didn't conform to ideals of femininity. That's the reason we know feminism and feminist history and women's studies are the reason we know about the three figures that became the subject of my book. But when that's our only framework for understanding the past, we lose a whole other aspect of gender history. And that's the aspect of queer history, of trans history, because we're simply not asking the right questions. We're not really asking or accounting for what was at stake for people who experienced gender variance and gender difference in the past. So um, in Before Trans, always have to have a little prop. Um, I use the modern trans framework in order to understand three figures, Jane de la Foy, Rachild, and Marc de Montifou, who lived at around the same time, in around the same place in Paris, um, who, and the, who experienced their gender in complex ways that did not fit into 19th century categories. And in particular, to see that their refusal to behave a certain way wasn't in order to reject patriarchal structures as was always assumed and it, as a way to understand all three, but rather a way to reject the gender binary. So in other words, their struggles and their writings weren't about advocacy on behalf of women or women's rights, but rather about coming to terms with who they were as individuals who did not really see themselves as women at all. And so in telling the stories of these three lives, I also offer a framework for an inclusive trans history that stretches back to before there was a way to talk about it as such. And that's something that's been difficult to do without the language in which to do so. Um, and in that sense, it offers important context for a set of questions that have been too often mistakenly perceived as new, what right? we think are people 
um, you know, think about this as potentially something new that's happening now, but in fact, it's simply the language that we have to talk about trans that's new, not the questions that eventually allowed that language to emerge. So even with the beginnings of what was called sexology in the late 19th century, the study of sexuality as a science, as a form of the kind of medical science that was growing throughout the late 19th century or the, throughout the 19th century, trans didn't exist yet at the time of these three writers as a medical or social category. Um, you're starting to develop an understanding of homosexuality and gender expression is kind of folded into that. So the understanding of sexual homosexuality is about sexual object choice and the way people appear becomes a kind of part of, of that rather than seen as an identity, a way of seeing oneself or something to be studied in its own right. And so for the, the, these three writers, a big thing, a big part of what I was looking at was how do you, how did they write about themselves before this idea of trans existed before they had the language in which to do so? How did they find, um, you know, what they were doing in part was creating a framework, finding words and narratives through which to define themselves. And they did this through writing stories in part. Um, and it's, it's not so different from, um, from, from where, how we, how we understand gender or come to terms with our own gender today in the sense that this is the time period, some of you have studied 19th century Paris with me before I know this, this is the time of the invention of the mass press and of mass culture. Um, there are tons of newspapers and tons and tons of writing um, and photography and visual culture. Um, and so just as we people today come to understand ourselves through kind of a combination of internal forces and senses of ourselves and external narratives, um, it was very similar in 19th century France. Sort of what I explore in the book is the way that these three are kind of pushing back, reading against the narratives that are being offered by the culture through which to understand themselves. Um, and so another key aspect of the way that I is framing it, what have been framing it is the notion of the gender story. Um, and by the way, I just wanted to say, um, so, the, in, in terms of how I'm using the term trans, which we could talk about more, um, but I use it in the broadest possible sense to mean um, someone who is, as the Susan Stryker definition, someone who has moved away from the gender assigned at birth. And that's just really a broad, ext extensive category um, that allows us really to think about gender expression as a form of identity um, in all kinds of, of complex ways. That's not about definitively, definitively identifying with one gender or another. Um, so another aspect of, well, we can leave up this handwriting. Um, another aspect of my framing is this idea of the gender story. So when you don't have a word to describe yourself, um, you often come up with a story instead. And this is something that we all do. We tell stories about who we are and how we came to be that way. And we adapt those stories over time. Stories allow depth and narrative in the place of the fixedness of a label or a single term. And so that's what I'm following in each biography. It's this triple biography, the ways in which these writers, each of whom wrote reams and reams of stories, treatises, essays, that's what the slide is about, just the sort of you know, outpouring, using up every corner of the page. All three of them have these extensive archives. Um, I'm looking at how they made sense of themselves through their writing and how they worked to settle themselves into narrative and adapted those narratives over time. So that's this kind of storytelling piece of it. Um, I wanna just say a quick word about the pronouns and, and then I'm just gonna kind of give you a glimpse of who each of these figures are. Um, and then Professor Schwab and I are going to chat. Um, I, for me, always the most interesting part is getting to talk to other people and hearing your questions, but I wanna make sure I just give you enough to kind of sink your teeth into and think about before we get there. So um, in the book, I stuck to the feminine pronouns by which these writers were mostly known, although they did experiment in their writing with different pronouns. Um, knowing that was an incredibly personal choice for anyone, I didn't feel comfortable choosing a different pronoun for them. Um, even knowing that they might most likely, had they lived today, um, probably would have. 
And it was also to preserve the historical record by maintaining the social contradiction between their gender presentation and their assigned gender. Um, but I've come to kind of over the course of these past several months and talking about the book and with in the field of trans studies, which is an emerging field that's constantly changing, there's really a practice now of using they them, not because we're saying when we're talking about the past, someone who was questioning their gender in the past. Um, it's not to say that that's the pronoun that they would have used, but it's a way to designate gender ambiguity. And I found that's really important because I want people not to think of these three writers as kinds of women, but rather people who were questioning um, that category entirely. And I do sometimes kind of go back and forth between she and they, which helps to convey the expansiveness of gender expression for the past and to capture the fluidity in which these figures necessarily had to live. The other piece of that is that as a scholar, as a historian, um, even though I'm, I am also an English professor, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, this work is very his historical, um, it was important to me that we think about, that we realize that pronouns in the past don't do the work that we're thinking they, it does, right? And so just to see that someone is designated a certain way in the past doesn't mean that they weren't gender questioning or there isn't some bigger, richer question story there. Um, okay, so just to give you a quick glimpse of these three figures, the first one, um, as I mentioned, is Jane de la Foy, who took me on this, on this journey to start with. And um, each section has a, has a kind of theme of what that, the main idea of the gender story. So masculinity for God and country, Jane de la Foy rose to battle with their husband, Marcel, um, during the Franco-Prussian War, just months after they were married. And this was their first time wearing pants. And it was an experience that de la Foy was deeply proud of. Jane returned to this masculine persona when accompanying Marcel to the Middle East to excavate the ancient city of Susa. That's Shushan. I always have to make the, the Persian tie-in to my Jewish audience here. Um, and this led to the opening of the Salle du Lafoy, which you can visit um, in the Louvre uh, next time you're in Paris, which hopefully will be um, easier to do one day soon. Um, Judafoy then be began wearing men's suits and this short haircut that you saw in those photographs and never returned to women's clothing. They were often seen side by side with Marcel in the most conservative academic and political milieu. The other side to Judafoy's success and public happiness was a questioning that one finds in their writing. Um, oh, this is the pants permit. This is not actually Judafoy's pants permit, but I, I meant to mention um, women were required to have a permit for wearing pants in 19th century Paris, um, and Judafoy had procured one. Um, so the other side was that uh, Judafoy wrote novels in which girls became boys and then struggled over their true identity. And they kept unpublished manuscripts of gender crossers over time that Jane and Marcel worked on together. So I traced that exploration um, in their travelogues in Persia, and I uncover a kind of story within the story of the Persian excavations that they did, um, where Julafoy is coming to terms with their own heroism, um, which was interestingly connected to narratives of French imperialism. That's a whole other complicated thing, um, but um, we can talk about that more later as well. Okay, so um, second part is Rachild, um, who's the most well-known among scholars who have embraced Rachild mostly as a rebel, rebel se savvy self-promoter, a certain kind of feminist, despite having written a treatise called Why I'm Not a Feminist. The answer to this question is something that they said in many ways throughout their life, um, that they were not a woman, that they preferred to remain neutral, as they put it. Rashid took on many different avatars, um, werewolf later in life being chief among them, and people thought they were being facetious or even provocative when really they were being direct um, and really kind of saw themselves as something that was not beyond human, you might even say. Um, the novel Monsieur Venus is the one I center my analysis on, and they're showing in this slide. Rachild went around with a calling card that said Rachild, man of letters, um, for a time in their life, but they then later married and sort of many chapters of this gender story. And then finally, Marc de Montifou started their career as an art critic. And you can see some of you have studied the history of, of French photography with me, the photographs 
do a lot of work in, in telling these stories as well. Um, Multifo first came to the public eye when they started writing erotic versions of Christian histories, um, for which the authorities came after them disproportionately, repeatedly sentencing them to prison because so many had assumed that the art critic, these are the, the, the censored writings, so many who had known Multifo as an art critic under that, that name, Marc de Multifo, assumed that they were reading the work of a man. And when it became clear that this was, well, at least not uh, their idea of what a man was, um, there was a kind of backlash and their writings were, were censor, censored repeatedly. People kept saying, well, just stop writing this stuff and you won't get sentenced to prison. Um, but they were very insistent about their right to be themselves, to, 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 to do what they needed to do to express themselves. Um, and they had their mantra was, je suis moi, I am me. It's sort of repeated ma manifesto, a longstanding, deeply held belief in the right to difference. Um, they identified with many writers over time who were perceived as different, um, including some of the ones that Jules Lafoy had written about in her in their biography of gender crossers. So there's this kind of turn to history shared um, actually by all three writers who are looking for examples of themselves in French history. And that was something that I found really, really interesting as well that linked up with my project, which was trying to recover this trans history and then to see that the writers that I was turning to were also trying to recover a trans history even if they didn't have sort of the terms for that. Um, that's a photo of Multifo and on the right are some letters from their archives that are addressed on the, the middle one says Madame, the other one says Mon cher confrère, which is in the masculine. Um, sometimes the envelope would have a different gender than the interior and vice versa. Um, and one has the sense that they really kind of enjoyed playing um, with these different kinds of identifications. Um, so hopefully that's enough to kind of launch us in, in conversation. Um, this was just a, a quick image from some of my research finds. One of the thrills of this kind of work was actually going to, to Paris, going to archives, but also the end of the book, I talk about going to Jane Dulafois home. Um, and so there's the image as I'd seen it in the magazine years ago when I was studying the magazines. Um, and then coupled with the actual fireplace that I was able to visit in Paris um, in, in 2018. And so there's just sort of the, the thrill of discovery that was part of this project as well. Um, so I'm gonna stop the share um, so that we can all see each other better and look forward to talking to Liesl. Hey everybody, it's so great to see um, former students, current students, colleagues. And also what a joy. So I just have to say this book actually came out last May, but the semester was over. We were still kind of deep in COVID and then somehow the fall was we, whatever. So it is, a, it is an overdue joy that we get to um, celebrate this book with Dr. Mesh and with all of you. Um, so one thing that I just found so rich in the book was the way in which you really articulated um, the fact that these three people had very different ways of kind of, you know, expressing themselves, but also responding to questions that they all got. They were all very public figures, right? So the press, the journalists, you know, they their their ways of presenting were a source of of um, fascination. And but they had very different responses to that. You write about Gilles Lafoy often reflecting that, whereas Khashield would often be quite direct, but then people thought she was being, you know, facetious or or witty. Um, and, you know, you really kind of articulate the differences among the three of them, but um, at the same time, as, a, as these three biographies together, they, you know, the sum is so much more than the whole of its parts or whatever. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about um, what you learned from putting these three people in conversation together, you know, through this lens. What I learned about about the time period and about um, about gender, uh, you know, kind of refusing the gender binary, telling gender stories, um, and and the experience of that, you know, both at the time and in general by sort of seeing them together in this light. Yeah. So um, the project 
it, you know, I had, I was familiar with all three of them before as a scholar of, of gender and particularly of women writers. Um, and when I started reading Du Lafoy's work in my kind of hunt to sort of figure out what was going on there and why it didn't align with the feminism that I was familiar with, Rachild immediately came to mind because um, I was reading Du Lafoy's novels. And also, you know, kind of part of this is as someone who works on kind of obscure French novels that no one has read, sometimes it's, 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 there's a lot of hunting around and you you get a 600 page novel that you don't necessarily aren't necessarily super excited to like make your way through because there's a reason it wasn't a bestseller um so i'm reading this Dieu la foi thinking this is uh, do i have to make my way through this thing it seems it's all very historical fiction um and then suddenly you know i'm in this gender story like full on so um that was just surprising and and thrilling to me and it clicked immediately with a novel by Rachild, the one I mentioned, Monsieur Venu. Some of you actually read that with me, I believe, Elazar and others, perhaps. Um, sorry, call it's so rude to call people out and they're just sitting there innocently feeling invisible. Um, but anyway, these are the risks. Um, and those are very, very different novels. Judafo was super, super conservative. Um, and Rachel was a kind of rebel who embraced her rebellious identity. So to think about those novels as essentially telling those the same stories um, in totally different styles um, was the kind of initial revelation, like just the idea of reading those two figures together um, was kind of the big, the move that I was making um, in the beginning. And that really, um, you know, was about thinking about gender, gender nonconformity, which has always been seen in the past as, oh, they were rebelling, they're trying to sell books, um, you know, there's some kind of agenda as opposed to an expression of self. And so as a scholar, you know, I, I'm actually sort of have been thinking about my methodology. I don't tend to write things with my methodology sort of all set out in the beginning. I tend to sort of reflect on it afterwards. And I've been writing an essay, um, actually these few pandemic months about the methodology for this book that has kind of been clarifying some of the things that I, that I took away. Um, and one of them is that what I'm doing is a little bit different than other people in my field in really trying to think about um, the authors as human beings that are not essentially different from us as human beings. People with whom I can empathize, people with whom you know, I can, I can feel things when you're writing biography, which is something I had never done before, um, or at least when I'm writing biography, I don't know how other people do it, but I had to sort of just take in their writings. I put that handwriting slide up there for you because there's something that comes through, through people's handwriting, right? There's like this kind of material essence that, that comes through when you see these things. Um, and so kind of sitting with these people, I, I connected with them in different ways. Um, and there was a kind of sense of their full humanity that came through that I hadn't attempted to sort of connect to, I don't think in earlier research in the same way. Um, and so I think that was, you know, that, that was sort of part of um, the experience of this for me. And what I've been talking about lately sort of within my field is that um, the gender diversity of the 19th century. I think someone asked in the in the chat, where uh, Paul asked, whether other European countries as con conducive to gender non-conforming artists as France. I don't think that we tend to say that about 19th century France. And yet, if you look at examples of the people who were living during this time, if you've studied decadent literature, um, they are you know, doing really interesting things with gender. Um, now I'm looking at Molly, um, who wrote a really interesting thesis about this. Um, and right, and and we we somehow we haven't had the words or the frameworks to see that. And so, um, and so that's a, a big takeaway for me. The past is much more di gender diverse than we allow it to be. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that methodology. I mean, because this something else that really shines through in the book is just how vast your research was. Like you said, you're reading these 600 page novels, you're reading plays, you know, many of them, some of them were playwrights, you're reading personal correspondence, journals, letters. Um, 
And I'm wondering if, you know, especially for other writers who are here, if you could talk a little bit more about your process of just taking all of that research and crafting it into these really human compelling narratives. Um, yeah, it was a process. <laughs> um, so, you know, I guess to sort of contextualize it for the, the wider audience, um, I was writing this book, it's the same publisher as published my previous book, but academic publishers, um, there's a kind of pressure to write for the quote unquote wider audience. Um, and I think in part out of teaching in an institution like this one as well, and trying to reach a wide audience that isn't necessarily everyone going to get a PhD in French liter literature, um, you know, not necessarily. But um, so that always made me think about how to pitch things and how to get people interested in what I am interested in. And I think that really actually prepared me in some ways for this kind of writing. Um, and so I really didn't want it, I wanted it to be accessible beyond my field to wider fields, um, but also to, to, a, to a wider readership. I wanted people to be able to pick it up. At the same time, um, it, you wanna be really careful and sensitive with the language and there's a lot to set up. These are actually, they're complex issues. They're not inaccessible, but they're, they're complex. Talking about gender can be complicated. Um, so it was a challenge, um, but um, I, I really kind of pushed myself to write it in a way that would bring these people to life. And, and so my process, which is, you know, I don't know if it's a, it's a helpful thing to explain really, but I would just sit with, I, I did them one at a time, the biographies obviously I kept revising, um, but I read as much as I could, as much archival stuff, as much first person stuff as I could get my hands on. Um, and when you're reading novelists who've written 50 novels, you don't have to read all 50. Um, oops, should I not have said that? Um, but you, you know, you read as much as you can, you read around things and you really start to hear their voice. You hear echoes that other people wouldn't hear. You hear repetitions when you're reading about their lives and you're reading their novels at the same time. I started to see like, oh, when they're talking about this, this is actually what they're, they must be referring to. And it's really cool. Um, but I, and I also, you know, started to sort of live with them as people imagine the Netflix version <laughs> of it, because there's all kinds of things that, you know, you don't have evidence for. And that's the other thing, right? No one, there's no diary here that says, I really feel this way. Um, that's something that, um, that one finds in doing queer history and trans history and history of those who are marginalized or don't have access to language or for whom saying things directly could be dangerous. Um, there are other ways to communicate these things. And in part, it was the resonances between the three um, and between other kinds of writings. Um, so it was a kind of intuitive reading, um, but there's a way in which, again, this doesn't sound like very like scholarly rigor, but, um, but there's a way in which I would sort of know, you know, there are things that I wasn't, wouldn't know and didn't, wasn't sure about, but the things that I did know, I knew. And it wasn't necessarily because there was some, you know, piece of evidence that pointed to it directly. You would just get a sense. And then you keep reading and you, and, it, it, and it's confirmed because this novel has this scene that kind of sets out that tension. And that's the thing you were picking up on. And then you realize there was this event in their life and that's what it's referring to. Um, and so um, it was really just about kind of sitting with these figures as people. And I guess the other piece of it for me as a cisgender woman, um, I, um, I wanted to hear as many first person trans and non-binary voices as possible. So while I'm reading everything about 19th century France, I am listening to every and reading every first person account because there was no monolithic, you know, there's no monolithic trans experience. It's not about that. It's not about a label. It's not saying, you know, are they or aren't they? It's about a lens. It's about a set of questions, um, you know, which are infinite, which are not limited to the ones that I was necessarily pick, picking up on. Um, and so that was what primed me to hear certain things and then to notice that they're all talking about, um, you know, that, that same kind of issue. Um, and, that, and the first thing was simply the, 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 the challenge of translating the self into language. 
So that was something that I read in first person trans memoirs, including that of our colleague Joy Layden, which was actually the first trans memoir that I read and it's absolutely gorgeous and a stunning piece of work. Um, but Joy, like many others, have, has talked about that, the stories that she told herself as a child. I realized that Julafwa and Rashid were telling themselves stories about their gender. And I thought that was really fascinating. And I just, I've, you know, I've seen a million examples of that. It's not the same story, right? Um, but it's the fact of storytelling, the, the impulse to try to translate your life into a story, into language. I have so many questions, but I know we're eager to open it up too. But just before we do, um, one I wanted to make sure to um, ask. So in the conclusion, you write, Jula Fah, and Montifo can be seen as precursors of a genre, that of gender stories, whose wide parameters are just coming into view. Um, can you say more about how histories such as this book can kind of impact our current discourse and compassion around uh, trans rights and trans vis visibility? I mean, absolutely, yeah. I, and I very much hope it does. I think, um, you know, it's empathy driven work. Um, the work of biography, as far as I've, I mean, in my experience is one of empathy, even though, you know, I don't agree with everything um, these writers did or thought and the male imperialist that Julefo is modeling themselves on is not, you know, a figure that one, you know, wants to admire. Um, but the, it, my, I, you have to identify with your, your book, with your topic in some way. So, you know, the previous one, having it all, that was easy to just be like, well, don't we all wanna have it all um, while we abandon our children, et cetera. But um, this one um, really came from, you know, there's like a basic human thing, which is the desire to be seen as your full self. I think we can all relate to that. There's a basic human thing that happens when you feel pressured to conform to certain cultural or societal standards that don't align with who you know yourself to be. Um, so there's an aspect of, um, of trans identity that is something we should all be able to relate to um, that became really vivid for me by reading first person voices. And that's not to say to generalize and just to say, right, this is something, this is just a universal story because it's not, it's a very specific one, but we can relate to the specific um, through this, you know, this basic human um, connection. So I hope that that, you know, that's the pathos that I feel that so many scholars don't bring to the past. Um, and so many of the previous treatments of Rashield are sort of disparaging and, um, you know, uh, mocking their shameless self-promotion um, as such without thinking, well, why? Why did they need to do that? Why were they saying these things, right? What's the impulse behind it? So I think already when you start to think about people as, you know, what drives them, um, that creates empathy. And it's also, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an understanding of, how to relate to people around you, how to, how to, my father came to one of his talks in the beginning and, and was like, this is like about parenting and, you know, seeing your child for who they are. It's deeply psychological. I know I have some psych people out there, um, you know, and I, it really felt to me deeply psychological um, in that sense. Like, um, and so, um, you know, I think those are some of the lessons um, from the book is just, you know, how to, how to treat, it's very simple, how to treat other people. And it's, you know, um, sort of in the thinking about how to raise um, trans and non-binary children is to let them tell you who they are. Um, and in some ways, that was my approach to history. We think of, right, people think of what I'm doing perhaps as imposing modern categories or something. I would say that generally 99.9% .9 of history is us imposing categories of gender normativity and heteronormativity. We do that all the time, implicitly. We expect every person and every couple we, um, we, we encounter in the past to be heterosexual and gender normative. Um, and what I was saying is like, let's just, let's have no expectations and listen to what these people are saying about who they are. We should actually do that with everyone. If we do that in the 19th century in the period that I analyze, 
there are so many things and stories that we haven't paid attention to because we're waiting for some, you know, giant flag that's saying, hey, look at me otherwise. And that's just not how it works. Um, and so that is a kind of basic principle um, that this work um, led me to. And it's a sort of just a sort of different set of lenses, um, you know, for, for looking at the world in general. Paul, did you want to take some questions from the chat? I think you're still muted, Paul. Thank you. Uh, yes, let's start at the top from uh, Guy de Fusco. What was the social cost of the writer's nonconformity? Interestingly, um, you know, they were in slightly different milieu. Um, and, um, and so one of the questions I had initially about Julia Fott, she was in this very conservative milieu and everyone just seemed to be fine with um, them dressing this way. Now, one of the ways they worked around that is that when you're an imperialist, when you bring pa back parts of Persia to Paris and you have a whole room installed in the Louvre, you can kind of do whatever you want um, because you're a kind of level of celebrity and hero um, that is untouchable. And so anytime anyone said, and by the way, why are you wearing pants? They would say, do you remember the time? Can, can I tell you a story about Persia? And there was a sort of strategic deflection. Um, and so they had this kind of separate status. Um, Rachel knowingly embraced this rebellious status and, uh, you know, but it was part of this bohemian literary artist world um, where they were kind of happy to be. Um, so, there was initial pushback when they first published this book that was very gender bending, Monsieur Venus, but eventually they kind of just embraced that because it felt better to Rashield to be seen as a monster, um, which is a word that, that they used, um, than to be not seen at all, right? Or to be seen as a kind of woman. Um, and so they sort of embraced this indecipherability as a way that was kind of more real um, to them. And, and Multifo maybe suffered most of all in the beginning because they kept getting sent to jail. It's not funny, um, but, uh, but it is kind of a, an inter, a fascinating story. Um, and I think that, uh, but you know, they were just, they, they had their world and their intellectual academic world where, um, where they um, eventually sort of found a way. And that was part of the story was them kind of wearing more and more the clothes that they were comfortable in. Um, and finding a world and a way in which to, um, to, to exist comfortably. And part of that was by writing about it. Part of that was by sort of the, the, the book itself as a kind of clothing, right? A way to sort of make themselves visible. And so for Montifo, it was about writing in a male voice that allowed them to kind of inhabit that masculinity. I think that was in a way soothing for them. And many write readers, because they weren't actually as famous as the others, I think many readers just assume they were male um, and were writing to the male author. And, um, and that I think was very affirming um, for Multifo. Uh, from Silka, is there a gender argument when they had to apply for a pants permit? Um, there, I mean, it's interesting. Of course, it, it's by, by definition a gender argument, but what they, they had to have a medical reason. Um, however, it's not really clear what a medical reason would be. Um, and the archives are partially burned, so we don't have all of the evidence of these permits. Um, but um, I think what that meant is you had to know a doctor who would write a letter for you, for these elite women. I mean, these women were, these figures were, were these writers were relatively elite. Um, but I think that the other people who got the pants permits would say they needed it for their job. And that would be the kind of medical reason, um, but it wasn't because they, you know, it wasn't a gender argument in the sense that they were saying like they need it sort of for their quote unquote dysphoria. It wasn't, it wasn't that sort of gender argument. Um, also from D. Fusco, how did you avoid imposing 21st century sensibilities on the people you featured? Um, well, so this is kind of what I was saying before. Um, I think that um, we, you know, we tend to assume that these are 21st century sensibilities when they are feminist or dealing with queer or trans or these kinds of 
of questions. Um, and I really, I'm, I really tried to let that their, their stories lead the way. Um, and it was a lot of peeling back of other 21st century sensibilities that were just clearly misunderstanding these figures, never quite lining up. The feminist frame sort of never quite made sense and was a very flattening one. Um, so it's a kind of delicate dance um, in the book in terms of terminology is very hard linguistically because you don't want to you don't want to apply labels that are that feel anachronistic and that don't let you really see the complexity of what um, you're looking at. And so that's really where the story was. It's not a, a book that's arguing they were X. It's a book that's saying, think about it this way. Think about gender. Think about gender departure as a form of identity. Now I'm going to tell you about their lives and kind of highlight those moments where they were experiencing and really struggling and grappling with the tensions around those issues. Um, from Jenny, has your experience working at a college seeped with traditional religious influences shaped your approach to your work? Have you felt a sense of conflict or concern at any point? <laughs> Jenny, going right there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, Jirafwa, whose name literally means God and faith, God the faith. It's a kind of it's a kind of extraordinary name um, in French. Um, was a deeply religious person, and um, and actually, one of the novels. Um, uses the story of Joseph as a kind of principal allegory for this character who leaves home and then wants to be recognized by their family as both the same person and a changed person. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. And, and the other thing about Jules Lafoy is how they managed to kind of write themselves back into the story. And I saw um, in that figure, someone who didn't want to reject a religion that she, that they were very much identified with um, and really wanted to find a way um, to align with it in that way. And, um, you know, I've certainly um, seen my students ask these kinds of questions, um, not just about queerness or transness, um, but just, you know, in general about fitting into the culture and that, um, you know, balancing that love and that want, wanting to be um, held up and, and connected with the tradition while wanting to be seen as themselves at the same time. Um, and so I think I, I had a kind of empathy for Jules Lafoy kind of coming um, from that. And um, so, I, you know, I think that that's sort of the, the, the main thing, how we struggle, we all struggle with, with how we relate to um, these um, cultural and religious um, uh, traditions and how we fit in and how we're seen by our families and by our, our cultures um, and all the kind of complex feelings around that. Um, in terms of working here, um, I was alarmed when I started this project that trans had become a kind of hot button issue, uh, you know, sort of uh, unexpectedly, um, given that there is no kind of visible trans community at YU, or at least, you know, not at Yeshiva College, um, or at the time. Um, and, and that was really too bad. So, um, of course, I mean, to, as an understatement. Um, so that's where my concern comes from. I think in my teaching, um, knowing that it's a very, it's not a simple place to be a queer student. Um, and, and it's not something that people, students can always talk about directly. Um, I am always mindful of the fact that there are queer students in every classroom, um, you know, most likely, right? Um, and so I hope, I try to teach in a way that everyone, no one feels excluded from the way that I talk about things. Um, but um, but I, I, it's also, you know, not always the easiest thing to talk about these themes and these questions um, because people aren't always comfortable asking those kinds of questions. Hmm even in a kind of intellectual reading a novel, you know, kind of way. From Benjamin, what style of story, for example, genre or POV, did these authors write? All different kinds. 
Um, and that's what makes it, um, you know, interesting. And, um, you know, it's not like there was some kind of literary movement where people were writing about these things in this way. People were writing about gender and sexuality in 19th century France all the time. They were a little obsessed. Um, but these stories are very, very different. So Giudafo was writing like really dry, um, you know, medieval histories because sort of Joan of Arc stories. That was one of the, the, the stories of the so-called transvestite saints um, were inspiring to Giudafo and they saw themselves in those stories um, and saw themselves as a kind of um, descendant of Joan of Arc. Um, whereas Rashid was taking up the decadent tropes where there's these, um, these, these writings that were about shock, shock and um, you know, eroticism and doing drugs and trying to have new experiences and trying to shock the reader. Um, and I think that they, um, as a writer, were very much concerned that there was something wrong with them, that this was some sort of form of illness, mental illness that they had. Um, and so there's a kind of self-loathing, um, sadly, that comes through in the writing and that's and a kind of vulnerability. So people read it as this, oh, it's so shocking and she's so decadent and audacious. Whereas I was reading it as, wow, this person is really struggling um, and, and, um, and is really, you know, there's something really sad and, and, and vulnerable in the way that they're presenting um, these things. Um, and then um, Montifo wrote a, a lot less directly um, but was always writing about people who were different and didn't want to talk about gender. Um, as, even though as the, you can see from the photographs, it was very much present in their own life. Um, and they had the pants permit and all that, um, but they were mostly sort of always standing up for people who were different, um, whether because they were unattractive and, and you know, people like um, Cyrano de Bergerac, Montifo has a whole preface about, about Cyrano and sort of relating to like, feeling, you know, not sort of connected to your, or feeling that your body doesn't reflect you fully, right? So there is some, some point of connection there. Um, but they wrote in, in all different genres. And I think that's part of the story is that, um, you know, gender nonconformity took as many shapes and forms as it, as it does today. There's no type of person. There's no type of writer. Um, it's these three very, very different people wrote in very, very different ways to tell versions of a kind of shared story. Uh, from Joan, is there any comparable literature of men assuming a public female gender identity? Um, it's a really good question. Um, not in this, not to the same degree. It was uh, it was easier. I don't want to say easier. It's maybe not the right adjective, but um, you know, when someone who was designated female presented as male, that elevated their status potentially in society right, to act as a man, um, gave them access potentially and was seen as a moving up. Whereas for a man to dress as a woman, that was, that's a very different gesture. Um, and so there were men, there were people who were, you know, who were uh, gender crossing, um, kind of male to female in costume balls and things like that, um, and who were kind of seen as more queer figures. But it's something that I want to explore more in my work because I think that, um, I guess sort of sartorially in their clothing, they didn't maybe take it as far. And I'm curious now to look back at some of these other figures who are clearly doing something with gender and their own persona. Actually, one of the things that's really interesting is their homes um, where they would have, like you saw a glimpse of Julafois fireplace, but there's this kind of queer decor. <laughs> um, so other ways that were, they were sort of in, encoding or making visible um, their gender difference um, and in, in sort of the private life. Um, and so I'm kind of following some of these more obscure things that we kind of mention as part of their eccentricity. <laughs> um, you know, there's this kind of unread eccentricity of 19th century France that I think has a lot to tell us um, about gender. Um, and Jeffrey adds, plus there's a well-established tradition of female authors writing under a male nom de plume. It's true. And it's and it kind of confuses things sometimes, right? Um, because there were women who were who were cross-dressing. It's not a word I use in the in the book when I'm talking about gender crossing and not um, a performance. 
Um, so, um, and, and this idea of women writing under men's names, right? That was, it was, a, it was just a thing that lots of women did um, who were not presenting as masculine. Um, and so, um, you know, there was a thing, there was some uh, social media thing where they were, now I'm trying to remember what it was, Liesl, maybe you remember, where they were like um, publishing, it was something they were selling where they had those pseudonyms alongside the quote unquote real names of female authors. And, um, and there was sort of a resistance from the trans community and trans historians saying, well, it was, it was a kind of feminist um, move to sell these, you know, sell these, I don't know, bookmarks or something with the real names of women writers who went by pseudonyms. Um, so that was like in the name of feminism, let's recover these women's lives. Um, and, you know, it's a problem because sometimes feminism does have a way of obscuring gender nonconformity um, in that kind of move, because some of those people probably had male pseudonyms because they identified with masculinity and not just because they were trying to publish books and have, you know, equality with male writers. So that non de plume, some, you know, it doesn't, again, it doesn't always mean what we think it means. It's a more, it is a more com complicated gesture for these writers. I mean, Rachild is a kind of gender neutral. It can be, ma sounds masculine or feminine. Um, and, and Jane de la Foy didn't take a pseudonym. And Marc de Montifaux, you know, lots of other, lots of women did take pseudonyms. So, um, so the whole process of naming um, can be, you know, is very, is very personal and we can't really generalize about that. We can't really generalize about why people who were assigned female wore pants and we can't necessarily gender, uh, generalize about why um, they would have chosen the names that they did. Joan, did you have a question? Joan, I, I think I you need to. I think you need to unmute. I think you have to unmute, right? Oh. Okay, there you go. Okay, now what I wanted to say is that in the 17th and 18th century, certainly in England, I mean not the 17th, the 18th and 19th century, certainly in in England. Um, choosing for a woman to a woman's choosing to publish under a male name was very commonly a commercial decision. Um, women writers did not sell, you know, so if you wanted to have a career that actually resulted in some, um, you know, in some financial gain, it was probably a very good idea. I mean, there's a big difference, I think, between George Eliot, who published under a male name because she wanted to sell, and between George Sand, who published under a male name, you know, also because she wanted to establish a masculine identity of some kind or a stronger or a stronger identity. So, so there is a real, there is a real difference there. I mean, no, I can't think of a single, you know, early English woman writer who would even dream of wearing pants or anything like that. They were very socially conventional, but they published under male under male names, you know, masculine names. But, uh, so it's, it's very different. Well, France and England have always been very different <laughs> and in regard to all kinds of sexual matters. <laughs> well, I'm sure there are examples. I mean, I don't know them offhand. I think that there are more examples and more work being done now to, to, yeah, to look, I mean, they're that, writers. 20th century, yes, I mean, very definitely 20th century. Well, for sure 20th century, 20th century but, um, but 19th century. 19th century. I didn't really, I don't, I can't think of a single one, you know, maybe there are, but I can't think of any, you know, that, uh, but anyway, it was very interesting. <laughs> thank you. Well, um, now, that, now that we're at the end of our hour, I'd like to thank everybody who joined us and everybody who asked questions. And of course, most of all, our, 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 our featured speakers, Rachel Mesh and Liesl Schwab, thank you very, very much for a very interesting and stimulating hour. Uh, please join us in the fall. We'll have another series of library book talks. And do take a look at the recently published Catalog of University Authors, which is on the library homepage. So thank you very much to everybody and good night. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>